Hello, um, I just want to welcome everyone here to our presentation on the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathobiology. Uh, my name is Sean. I'm in the last year of my PhD here. And today we'll be exploring different stories, different journeys, to kind of give you a sense of what we're about, what we care about, and what kind of challenges we like to take on as a department. So I thought I could start by just starting with my own story. So I did my undergraduate degree at U of T Scarborough in biology. And I remember when I was in my fourth year, I was trying to figure out you know, what the next stage would be. You know, what am I going to do? Uh, well, you know, the world was really big, and I, you know, there were so many things to do, I just didn't know where to begin. And, um, but what I did know is that I wanted to be part of something that was meaningful, and I wanted to help people. So naturally, I was considering something like medicine. but. I felt that gaining a deeper understanding to biology, to disease, to patient care would ultimately make me a better physician. So when I was considering graduate school, you know, LMP really stood out for me um, because I felt you know, the department was not too small and it wasn't really too big, but I felt it was the right size because I wanted to meet cool people, and I wanted to interact with them. I came from U of T Scarborough. I wanted something that had that sense of community. But I also wanted to be part of meaningful science. And I felt that that's something that I could do here. So that ultimately brought me to a project working with Rod Bremner, uh, who's at Mount Sinai Hospital. He's an LMP faculty member. And he basically tasks me with this a project to prevent heritable cancer. Um, so unlike, unlike uh, sporadic cancer, heritable cancer is usually linked or initiated by a single mutation. And because of that, we can have an idea about the timing and the pathogenesis. We can predict these things. So my project is in a particular kind of eye cancer called retinoblastoma. And we originally identified these two factors which are important for its initiation. So I basically had to take that basic discovery and make it so that a doctor could use it in the clinic. So I made these little targeted eye drops and that block transformation in normal cells, and they ultimately block cancer. Uh, so we're in the process now of translating that. Uh, we're working together with a company in the UK. Uh, we've talked to lawyers, we've worked in different hospitals, we've collaborated with people at Stanford, Harvard. Uh, we worked with people at CCBR here in Toronto, McMaster. And it's been a really exciting experience because you're seeing a lot of different, uh, a lot of different people and in, in being involved. So at the end of the day, my journey in LMP has taught me a lot about being part of something bigger and how to impact something in healthcare. And while my originally, uh, original idea was maybe pursuing medicine, I really underappreciated the kind of excitement of working with you know, cool, brilliant, diverse minds. So right now, I'm considering something along the lines of practice consulting. And so we're here today to hear these kinds of stories, um, the cool and exciting stories that take place here in the laboratory of medicine and pathobiology. So we have, up next, um, Dr. Kareem Mikhail, who's a Canada Research Chair and faculty member here at LMP. Without further ado. All right, thank you, Sean, for the kind introduction. It is really a pleasure to be here today and to tell you a little bit about uh, what we do and how Tiny Yeast uh, is helping us solve big health problems for uh, us humans. Uh, so in my lab, we ask a number of fundamental questions. Uh, we ask, why do we age? Why do we age differently? Are there genes that control aging? Uh, would such genes be affected by the human experience? For example, are my genes affected uh, by this particular presentation I'm doing here or by my environment? Are there connections between aging and age-related diseases such as cancer and neurodegenerative diseases? And ultimately, the goal is to address this question is how can we stall the bad aspects of aging and abolish age-related diseases. So in my lab, we use uh, a couple of uh, genetic systems. Uh, we employ in particular combination of yeast and human genetic models. 
So the reason for this combination is that most of the really important uh, genes and cellular processes uh, that are important for life are shared between yeast and human. So yeast cells uh, have an advantage, though, over our human cells is that they can be rapidly grown and are easily modified uh, to delete or manipulate genes. So if you have a gene you want to see if it's important, it's very easy to get rid of that gene and see how things change in the cell. Then our findings in yeast are translated to human systems, where we typically end up finding the same fundamental processes, but of course with some uh, differences. And we're finding that for the types of questions that we're asking, this is really helping us accelerate uh, discoveries. So once, we, uh, once certain genes are identified in uh, various diseases by sequencing uh, samples from patients, uh, the, we move along this discovery wheel here in my lab where uh, we assess the function of the gene in yeast confirm it in human cells, then we end up going back and forth between the yeast and the human systems uh, to dissect the function of that gene a little bit more, and then we move into multicellular models such as mice, and also uh, assess samples uh, that are coming from patients. And the goal here is that we keep feeding this wheel uh, further and further, and through these multiple rounds or cycles, we can really dissect the, the important functions for disease-related genes. So don't take my word for it. Uh, yeast is actually important for human uh, biology and health. So here's a list of some of the discoveries, or Nobel Prize winning discoveries, I should say, uh, that actually uh, were in large part due to yeast genetics. And uh, while you may or may not be familiar with these uh, discoveries here that are listed, hopefully you'll appreciate at least that uh, they have had a huge impact on our understanding of aging, cancer, how cells are dividing, how our muscles are functioning, and pretty much everything uh, uh, that we, that's happening inside of our human bodies. So what are the types of stories or discoveries that came out of our approach to uh, biomedical discovery? I'm going to tell you uh, just a little bit of a couple of stories. In this first one, uh, it turns out that our DNA is non-randomly arranged in the nucleus, which is actually defined by a nuclear envelope. Uh, and we found that uh, this critical to this non-random organization of the genome inside the nuclear envelope is the attachment of key pieces of the DNA, shown here, uh, to this nuclear envelope by conserved protein complexes. And uh, so this is true in healthy individuals. Now in premature aging patients, uh, or kids uh, in some cases, what you see is that the, you lose the function of these tethering complexes and the DNA is released from the envelope. This leads to the collapse of the entire genome and this is actually thought to be a major driver, not just in premature aging, uh, as you see here in, in this particular uh, child, but also in uh, how we are aging naturally. So in the next story uh, that I'm gonna tell you about, actually uh, it has to do with, um, I'm gonna talk about amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. So ALS has been in use a lot uh, lately because um, of the ice bucket challenge, as well as uh, the movie um, about uh, Stephen Hawking. So um, what did we actually find here that's informing uh, or changing our understanding of ALS? So it turns out it's actually a very fundamental discovery about what's happening in the cell. So <clears throat> what I'm showing you here is an early stage of gene expression. So here you have the DNA in these two shades of blue, and this big blue enzyme is synthesizing RNA, and critical to uh, the RNA floating away from the DNA is that the RNA needs to be recognized by this protein here called ataxin 2. And this allows the RNA to float away from the DNA and for proper gene expression to occur. So what we found in that in cells lacking this ALS-linked ataxin-2 gene, 
the RNA is actually misguided or lacking guidance, and it's not able to float away from the DNA. Instead, it gets stuck on the DNA behind the enzyme, and this actually stalls uh, gene expression. So students in my lab were the major drivers behind uh, these stories I told you about, and how did they disseminate the research results? So some of the, uh, or most of the results are published in scientific journals, and we typically aim for impactful scientific publications, including uh, top journals such as Nature Journal, Cell Journals, and other leading open access journals. Uh, students also give several presentations. These could be local, national, or international. And we are actually quite lucky in LMP that uh, we have these uh, LMP-specific travel awards that make it easier for supervisors like myself to send my students to more and more of these expensive international conferences. And as Sean alluded to earlier, we, there's also another way of disseminating uh, research findings through patents and um, intellectual property rights. So our LMP faculty and students have consistently uh, won uh, several prestigious uh, awards and scholarships. So our faculty, we have several faculty who are Canada Research Chairs. Uh, CIHR new investigator awardees or holders, and uh, also several of our faculty members receive field, top field-specific uh, specific prizes, such as the Manpei Suzuki uh, Diabetes Prize. Our students are doing exceptionally well. Uh, we have um, students winning all sorts of scholarships and awards, including the highly prestigious uh, Vanny Doctor Scholarships. And we also have both faculty and students who, are, uh, who have received the Canada Governor General Gold Medal, which is typically awarded to the top uh, graduating doctoral students at uh, Canadian uh, universities. So what's the path to success in LMP? So once you're admitted in our department, uh, you are gonna work closely with the supervisor as well as committee members to both plan for and conduct your research. And this will eventually uh, lead you to uh, uh, achieving a number of publications and receiving a number of awards. Then you're gonna write and defend your thesis and graduate and choose the next step of your career. So where are some of my former lab members uh, today? So they're really, uh, are choosing highly diverse uh, set of careers. So I have several students who are in the academic research uh, branch. As some of them are postdoctoral fellows, others are research associates and so on. And they're in prestigious universities including Toronto, Stanford, and McGill. Uh, some of my students are also uh, in the biotech or biopharm industry at the moment. Some are uh, contemplating becoming scientific editors. Um, and one of my former undergraduate students is actually a CEO of his own biotech startup company, and I'm really rooting for him. It's quite a challenge to establish a company from scratch. We also have several students who uh, combine the knowledge that they gain in our department and in bio biological sciences uh, with uh, professional degrees such as medicine, law, and dentistry. So with that, I'm gonna thank you uh, for your attention. And I'm going to introduce our next speaker. So it is really a pleasure to introduce Dr. Michelle Bendick, who is professor and research director in our Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathobiology. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kareem. And thank you, everyone, for being here today and attending. Um, so I'm here to talk a little bit about the department in general and a little bit about my lab and some of the things that we do in the lab. So we're really involved in LMP in a wide spectrum of research, and it's all centered on answering questions in experimental and clinical pathology. The techniques we use encompass biochemistry, physiology, immunology, molecular genetics, and even bioengineering. So we really offer everything that other basic science departments offer but falling under the larger umbrella of understanding the mechanisms of human disease and pathogenesis. 
LMP has nine research areas, which we've um, grouped people into thematic research groupings. Um, the most popular and populous of these areas include cancer research, infectious diseases, neuroscience, and cardiovascular disease. My research, in fact, focuses on cardiovascular disease, in particular, on atherosclerosis. This is an inflammatory and fibrotic disease of blood vessels, and in fact, it affects over half of our population, so it's a clinically important disease. My lab is a matrix biology lab, and we study how the extracellular matrix controls the biologic responses of cells in the vessel wall. To do this, we use molecular and cellular models, as well as animal models of disease, and our research really bridges these two areas. Recent work done by my grad students, Essera Digazel, Josh Lopez, and Amanda Mohabir, using mouse models of atherosclerosis, has identified a new and exciting role for a unique matrix protein, type 8 collagen, in mediating formation of the fibrous cap. And the fibrous cap is an important structure because it protects the cap and protects against plaque rupture. And in fact, plaque rupture is the most important cause, the most common cause of heart attacks. So we're also very excited that in new, more translational research that we've done, we've been able to show that type 8 collagen is expressed in the cap of human atherosclerotic plaques. So our work is not only important in mice. So my students over the years, there they are. Um, this is a relatively current picture of my research lab. But my students over the years um, have really been a great group to work with. Um, here's sort of a representation of a typical day in the Bendak lab. We do a lot of microscopy work, so we do a lot of experimental pathology, looking through the microscope at tissue samples. We also often have coffee breaks, and no doubt we're discussing, intensely discussing scientific discoveries in the lab at this coffee break. Uh, we also do some other activities. Um, this was a couple years ago. We participated in the protest march at Queen's Park, the Get Science Right protest march. And on a more fun note, we occasionally get out and do canoe trips and ski trips. So it's been a lot of fun to um, work with people, but also have a little bit of a life outside the lab with our lab group. Well, ultimately, for all the graduate students, it leads to the important process of convocation. And I'd li just like to show you pictures of a few of the people who've been in my lab over the years and tell you a little bit about where they are now. So Dr. Essera Digazel was a PhD student in my lab, and she has gone into biotech in a, the largest sense. She's now scientific, scientific director at LASIK MD. And she was actually brought on to help to train ophthalmology students um, to learn how to write papers and how to present their research and to write grants um, to, so that this um, very um, corporate entity is, uh, is establishing an increasing presence in the research environment. An MD-PhD student in my lab, Dr. Christopher Franco, uh, moved to UBC. He became a dad, a really, really cute little daughter here with his wife, Jenny. And he's currently in his first year in cardiology residency at UBC. And Chris actually continues to collaborate with the lab. He's um, doing work in collaboration with Bruce McManus at the University of British Columbia. And we've, in fact, um, are still publishing, um, ab publishing and presenting abstracts together. So Chris will hopefully stay in research. Dr. Peter Sabatini went from a PhD um, into a clinical genetics training program at the Hospital for Sick Kids, and he's currently working as a clinical lab laboratory geneticist there. And one of my current graduate students, Josh Lopez, will be graduating this summer, defending his thesis this summer, and he's just been accepted into Tyndale College, the teacher's college there. And Teachers College is actually a recurring theme in my lab. One of my former master's students, Bernard Ho, um, actually completed Teachers College before he joined the lab. And he went on to um, work up through the ranks and become a professor in liberal arts and sciences at Humber College. And he is currently a curriculum director there. So finally, um, like Karim, I do have a good example of a, an undergraduate student who's graduated and gone through the ranks. Um, Dr. Katie Rainer was one of our first LMP undergraduate pathobiology specialist graduates, and she's now a professor, an assistant professor at the University of Ottawa and at the U Ottawa Heart um, Institute. So, whoops, sorry. So I'll leave Bernard up here so everyone can enjoy his brilliant smile. Um, this was a Christmas party in the lab. Probably we're not supposed to do Christmassy things in the lab, but this was a number of years ago. Um, so we do a number of things to prepare our students for their next steps and to give them transferable skills that can be used in their future careers. 
So I'm a highly collaborative, I run a highly collaborative research program. I encourage my students to seek help from local and international experts. And also being at the top of my field and organizing and sharing meetings in my field, I make sure that my students get to meet and know the leaders in the field. So that helps them to establish connections for future job opportunities and training opportunities. I also seek out collaborators to make sure we're keeping up to date and uh, on top of the state of the art techniques to address our research questions. So we've recently been awarded an NIH grant together with labs from the University of Pennsylvania and Boston University. Um, and what we're doing is using nanotechnology to measure the mechanical properties of type 8 collagen in the vessel wall and in the atherosclerotic plaque. I think one of the best things about our graduate program as a whole is that we provide students with many opportunities to present their work. And this is done locally, within the department, at lab meetings, in graduate courses, nationally at meetings, and internationally. So um, I think this is one of the real strengths of our department, and um, they're encur encouraged and supported to attend conferences. Um, to prepare students in my lab, we rehearse presentations, so it's not uncommon for us to spend two plus hours rehearsing for a 20 minute talk. But this really leaves our students very well prepared and as a result, they go out and they win international presentation awards competing against the best labs in the world, students from the best labs in the world. So it's excellent preparation and it develops their communication skills and those things are really applicable for any future career. So with that, I'd like to say thank you for attending, for listening today, and I'd like to um, pass the microphone on and introduce Dr. George Sharmas. He's an assistant professor and director of the Molecular Diagnostic Lab at Mount Sinai Hospital, and he's also a former LMP graduate student, so one of our truly great success stories. Thank you, Michelle. So outside of my clinical duties, I co-supervise co an LMP uh, PhD student. Uh, I'm engaged in proteogenomic research uh, as well as molecular genetic research um, with direct clinical application. <clears throat> Within my clinical lab, uh, we process nearly 3,000 uh, patient samples per year for various genetic testing. One of, one of our uh, bread and butter tests or, or higher volume testing is sequencing of BRCA1 and 2 for patients with suspected inherited forms, um, the inherited form of uh, breast and ovarian cancer. And uh, recently we've implemented a new uh, method of detecting uh, mutations and, and pathogenic variants within BRCA1 and 2. It's called next generation sequencing. It's, uh, it, it affords us the potential of, of sequencing more than just the two genes, but many, many genes within many patients at the same time arguably a lot more sensitive than our current method, which is Sanger sequencing, our current gold standard, I would say. Um, my base knowledge that prepared me to push uh, the envelope of what we offer clinically um, to patients is rooted in my LMP education, without a doubt. I did both my master's and PhD in LMP, but prior coming back to Toronto, I did my clinical molecular genetics postdoctoral fellowship at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. Uh, I was lucky, I was selected as the only molecular fellow entering um, that year from countless applicants. Uh, but what made my application appealing to them was the translational work that I did within LMP. At Hopkins, I used to attend a genetics clinic and I would attend with world famous uh, clinical geneticists and uh, the daunting task of when they ask you a question uh, that they're actually asking for your advice as a, as a laboratory um, a scientist and, and uh, a clinical um, colleague, it was pretty much the first time that I actually called upon all of my, my, my education. And it was, it was scary at first, but you know, it, was, it was rewarding in the end that you're actually facing a patient and you help those patients directly. Um, so I, it, it was those moments that I really realized that I was prepared, prepared well from my education here. Um, 97% of our graduates are employed or are pursuing further studies. Um, we help students to develop critical thinking skills and prepare, prepare them for a wide variety of careers. Academia, the biotechnology um, and pharmaceutical industry, the nonprofit sector, healthcare, government, communications, consulting. Actually, since uh, 
Kareem brought it up with uh, the movie thing, <laughs> I thought I would mention that while I was an LMP graduate student, I was fortunate to be a genetics con uh, consultant on a motion picture called Splice um, by Vincenzo Natale and featuring Sarah Pauly and um, Adrian Brody. And, uh, but the challenge in the role was actually had to, having to change the script to be much more realistic, and that's a very hard thing to do with, uh, with, the, in <laughs> with the movie industry. Um, but I did have to call upon a lot of my lessons learned in my LMP lectures to try and take something that was really way out there and try and bring it halfway, meet them halfway. So um, that, was, uh, that was great. We have alumni who are completing their postdoctoral fellowships at the University of California, Harvard, MIT, and Stanford. Some of our alumni have titles such as professor at U of T's Department of Chem uh, Biochemistry, senior editor at Nature Medicine, marketing manager at Janssen Pharmaceuticals, Inc., clinical scientist at Bor uh, Boringer Ingelheim Limited, and the list goes on. So uh, we actually have uh, placed ourselves really well internationally. I'd now like to call upon our next uh, speaker, Richard Wu, who's an LMP student in the MD-PhD program. Hi, uh, thank you for that introduction, George. So my name is Richard. Um, I'm in the third year of the MD-PhD program, and I'm currently doing my PhD phase of my training in the department of LMP. So my professor is Dr. Philip Sherman, and I work at SickKids. And for my project, I'm looking at various ways to improve infant nutrition by studying the, invest, um, the interaction between different oligosaccharides and intestinal epithelial barrier function. So before I entered graduate school, I had a lot of anxiety about you know, what's about to come. Um, actually, the biggest fear for me was how to transition from being a medical student to now being a graduate student. Because from a clinical background, I didn't really have a lot of experience in basic science research. I didn't know how to do a Western blot. I didn't really know how to write a research proposal. And the biggest you know, challenge was where do I find help? But when I entered L LMP, I found that this was actually very easy for me to transition into the life of being a graduate student. To start, for the community life in LMP is phenomenal. There's tons of things happening. The community is very small, so you tend to know everybody on a first name basis, and it's very easy to pick up where your colleagues are good at, what they're doing for their projects, and set up collaborations and seek help. Apart from that, it's a very friendly and collegial environment, and we also have a lot, a lot of activities and social events where students can participate. For example, when I entered, there was an annual barbecue at the Central Island where we get a chance to mingle with the faculties and students and incoming um, students in that year. And I got a chance to meet a lot of friends, and there was tons of great food and tons of activities you can participate in. So these are some pictures that we took from the barbecue. So for example, here we have the water balloon throwing contest, and it was just a good way for us to meet the colleagues and build a lot of friendships in this uh, department. Because I think what we have to realize is that during graduate school, a lot of the challenge is that when we get really caught up in our research, we tend to be siloed into our individual research environments. And when we get caught up in that, it might be a very isolating experience for graduate students. But in LMP, with the mix of all of these different activities you can do in student life, you don't really get that sense of isolation. For example, right now I'm in my second year of my PhD training, and for me, I don't do a lot of time in courses anymore. And however, every week we have these LMP seminars on every Monday afternoons. And it was a great way for me to reconnect with the friends and see how they're doing and get a sense of what else is going on in the community. And these little things, you know, getting updates on what the social events are, what is the, you know, sports opportunities. For example, we have an indoor soccer club. These are just ways that you can really enrich your experience, experience in the graduate, um, graduate school with a student life, with a community life. And I felt that was really encouraging for me. So aside from the student life experience in LMP, what really stood out is the phenomenal faculties and administrative staff. They really go out of their way to really make things work for you and they try to push you to succeed. And there are so many opportunities when I can recall on my own experience, when I try to apply for various awards, when I have a lot of you know, issues to discuss, I can just always knock on the doors of the office of Farzine, for example, and they're always available to answer my questions, answer my phone calls, and be patient with me to answer all my you know, sensitive issues about graduate school. 
And this really translates into the amount of, um, so this is a picture from the indoor soccer club that we have in LMP. And this really translates into the success that LMP students have uh, been receiving in terms of award. For example, the Vanier Canada Graduate Scholarship is the most prestigious doctoral award and its total amount of 50,000 per year for three years. And from its inception, a total of 15 LMP students have received this award. And just this last cycle, four students from U of T have received this award in the health category, one of them including myself. And besides the Vanny Award, but there are also other scholarships that LMP students can have achieved. For example, the Ontario Children's Scholarship, as well as the Connaught International Scholarship. And what's even crazier is that last year, one of our, um, one of our doctoral students, Dr. Mack, he actually received a Governor General's Award, and that's only awarded to the top um, academic students in the graduate department of Canadian universities. So from all these examples, we can see that LMP students do exceptionally well. And I think that a lot of it comes from individual success, but really it also comes from a supportive environment with phenomenal mentors and a supportive staff from the administrative team. So there's various ways to connect with LMP. So first, um, on the GLSE website, you can look up LMP ambassadors. So I myself is an LMP ambassador. And you can read up on our bio, read up our, um, where we came from, and also you can contact us if you have any questions. Secondly, we have open door sessions. So there's two dates available on March 18th on Wednesday and March 26th on Thursday. And last but not least, you can also contact us by visiting the LMP website, lmputorno.ca. Good morning. Uh, my name is Harry Elschultz, and I'm the graduate coordinator for the LMP graduate program. I'm joined this morning by... Hi, I'm Ramaponda. <clears throat> I'm the graduate admissions coordinator and at the Department of Lab Medicine and Pathobiology. And uh, Rama and Farzeen are the two people who are, you'll be most likely to meet if you uh, come to see us in, in the uh, sixth floor of the MSB. Uh, they run the graduate office. So um, I'm glad you had a chance this morning to hear what some of our faculty and students had to say about the graduate program, telling you a little bit about what you do in the program and also what you might be able to do when you complete your studies here. Uh, what I'd like to do for the next few minutes is just to run through a few of the things that might be of more immediate relevance, having to to deal with your uh, admissions and uh, the early stages in the program. So I'll bring your attention once again to our website, which has been um, uh, set up to be most formative and tell you a lot about the kinds of things that our uh, students and faculty are doing. <clears throat> So a bit about the admission requirements. Uh, one of the things that our department looks for is high standing in coursework that is relevant to uh, the LMP program. So we're looking for students who do well in things like molecular biology, cell biology, genetics, biochemistry, and physiology. Uh, we do expect an overall a grade point of uh, an A minus, but we will be looking primarily at the courses that are most relevant to our program. Uh, just to let you know, uh, our department does have some uh, incentives for early admission, for early applications. Uh, we have a $10,000 LMP scholarship of excellence and also a refund for your admission costs for $120. Uh, these incentives do fall within the guidelines of the guaranteed stipend uh, for the Faculty of Medicine. Um, our entrance scholarships, uh, are uh, there's a number of these. Uh, some of these are specific to certain groups, such as uh, if you come from Atlantic Canada, uh, you could be eligible for a new award that was just set up last year, and that's the David Naylor Award. Uh, we were fortunate last year that one of our students won this award in its inaugural year. Uh, there's also uh, special incentives and, and awards for uh, international students. One of these was already mentioned by earlier speakers, uh, such as the Trillium Scholarship, and there's also the Connaught Fellowship, which is from the University of Toronto. And just to let you know, uh, two prestigious awards that uh, you should apply for are either the NSERC or the CIHR Scholarship. Uh, these awards uh, can be applied for even before you uh, join the program, so you're advised to uh, get your applications in early, and we do have a deadline for that in early December. 
And just to let you know that students who do receive external awards that exceed 15, that are the $15,000 mark or higher, uh, do qualify for a merit bonus or a top up on their stipend. Now one of the nice things about uh, doing graduate studies in the Faculty of Medicine, including our department, is that the stipend is guaranteed. Uh, graduate studies often require students to spend a fair bit of their time doing uh, TAing uh, or to be able to top up or to supplement their stipend with scholarships. That's not a requirement in our program. Uh, PhD students uh, have a, a stipend of almost $28,000 and master's students a stipend of about $26,000. So one of the other uh, things that we try to do in our graduate program is to keep the emphasis on your research. Uh, we know that when you come into the program, you've already done a lot of uh, coursework, and we do have some coursework at the graduate level, but we try to keep this uh, sort of focused uh, and more at a minimum so that the time for your research uh, is greater. So all students do participate in a weekly seminar course. Master students also take a half course uh, in our molecular cellular mechanisms of disease and PhD students take the equivalent of two full courses and we do try to keep very uh, flexible in the kinds of courses that you take so you can really tailor the education that you're getting. Uh, you might find that towards the end of your program your interests have changed a little bit and if you have an interest in courses that are offered by other departments that will be available to you. Now, one of the things that uh, Dr. McHale already mentioned in his uh, presentation is that students in LMP have the opportunity to travel and to present their uh, research uh, at uh, in a number of different venues, both at the local, provincial, uh, national, and international level. Uh, our department has an excellent track record for allowing students to uh, travel abroad, and this gives you exposure to uh, other work that's going on uh, on the world stage and also to make contacts and build your network for the time that after you finish the your graduate studies. Uh, it's also true that we have a lot of departmental awards, uh, restricted funds that are available just to our students. You can apply for these awards as well. And in terms of presentation opportunities, uh, one of our big events, um, and one that is organized by the uh, Graduate Student Executive CLAMPS, is uh, the annual Graduate Research Conference. And this is where essentially all of the students in our program get a chance to uh, show posters, and, and some give oral presentations on their research and you get feedback from uh, judges and from other people who are attending the event and can talk to you about your work. So that's just a very quick uh, synopsis of the things that uh, I want you to keep in mind as you think about uh, where you want to do your graduate studies. Uh, we do have a few minutes, maybe about five minutes or so, that we can open up for questions and uh, Rama will assist me with that. Yes. Now, Harry, one of the more uh, common questions we receive is that, what is more important, research experience or grades? Well, I think uh, a lot of students do try to get uh, research experience either at the fourth year level by taking project courses mm -hmm. uh, or by doing summer research. And uh, these are valuable experiences and they will certainly be to your advantage if you can start your graduate program with them in terms of how quickly you can get into your uh, experimental work. However, uh, they don't substitute for good grades and we do still require, especially for the types of courses and the topics that I mentioned at the beginning of my uh, talk uh, that you do really well in those. So um, if in some special cases perhaps where a student has, sli has slipped up a little bit and has in, in their coursework but has done really well at the research level, we do look at every case on an individual basis. But I would emphasize that you try very hard to uh, work hard on your grades, uh, especially in uh, fourth year courses uh, towards the end of your program because this is what it gives us a sense of how much at the pre-master's level you are and ready to start. Uh, your graduate work. Okay, thank you, Harry. Now, another important question that we receive quite often is um, for students who already have a supervisor, they found someone who can supervise their studies at the master's or PhD level. Does that help in their application to the program? Again, I, th I think I would say this is an advantage to you. If you've, for example, worked with somebody over the summer or in a fourth year project and uh, you get along great and the supervisor says she would like to take you in, into her lab, uh, that it gives you an advantage certainly if 
you are admitted uh, because you could then uh, quickly begin to start your experiments, whereas other students from the time they're admitted still have to spend a fair bit of time interviewing and finding the right match. Uh, however, um, this does not sort of take the place of um, meeting the requirements for admission. So even for students who do have uh, a supervisor lined up tentatively, uh, you do still need to meet the uh, departmental requirements. Okay. Now, one aspect of the application is references the students have to provide. Now, how important are they for the application? Well, I think we say um, on our website that uh, references are important. Um, and uh, keep in mind, too, that these should be academic references. So um, probably your mom is not the person to go to to get a, a reference. This is uh, not so much a character reference, but one that tells us how good your strong your background knowledge is in LMP relevant subjects. And uh, just in, in general, uh, how prepared you are perhaps at the research level as well. So I guess uh, a good combination that we would look for is if you have a uh, third or fourth year professor who you've come to know and maybe somebody that you've talked to after class that you've engaged with and they get a little bit of sense about how you think and know that you can ask uh, good questions other than you know uh, what do I need to know for the test for example um, that would be a great person to uh, ask for a reference the other one being uh, if you have had the opportunity to do some uh, research uh, talk to somebody who can comment on your work in the lab and this would be both in terms of your um, ability at the bench and also how good you can fit uh, into the lab those are valuable things for us to know when we review your application okay uh, another question we receive is uh, the entry requirements for our studies is an A minus minimum which is a GPA of roughly 3.7 how strict is this uh, requirement so for the most part, uh, while we say A- is sort of the, the magic uh, uh, level that we want you to be at, uh, we do look at the courses on an individual basis. So um, if you have uh, perhaps slightly lower a lower GPA, but you do have high grades in the right courses, uh, you might uh, do okay. On the other hand, if your higher grades are in courses that are in the uh, humanities uh, or in, in areas that are not that relevant to the graduate program, uh, that would not serve you that well. So we look at um, sort of which courses you've taken, uh, where the high grades are, and also the level that they're at. So uh, this is an area that also becomes sometimes a little bit problematic, where a student uh, who thinks the main focus should be on getting high marks ends up taking uh, second year courses, 200 series courses in their final year just to bump up their uh, GPA. I would advise against doing that because one of the things we look for, again, is uh, how how well are you doing in courses that are at an advanced level? So choose your courses carefully uh, because we do look at the grades, but we also look at, at which courses you've taken. Okay, thank you. Now, we don't have any additional questions from the floor. I think that's um, all for today. Thank, thank you. you, Harry. Okay.